Amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's pray. Now, Father, as we open your word, we ask you to speak to us. Because, Lord, we know not only is there a God in heaven who loves us, there is also a devil headed to hell who hates us, who wants to undermine us, trip us up, get us to compromise. Lord, give us eyes to see his strategies and deceits and avoid them and stay as close to you as we possibly can. We commit this time of Bible study to you now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All righty. Well, hello, everybody. Hello, Harvest Orange County, Harvest Kumalani, all of you watching online for Harvest at Home. We're in our series that we're calling The House of David, and we're in two passages for our message, and they are 1 Samuel 22 and Romans 12. 1 Samuel 22 and Romans 12, the title of my message is Don't Make Deals with the Devil. Okay, some of you have heard this before, but some of you haven't. So there was a bear hunter out in the forest looking for a prey. Suddenly he laid his eyes on a big, giant bear. He lowered his rifle. He got the bear in his sights. He exhaled, and he began to carefully squeeze the trigger when the bear turned around and said, Excuse me. Isn't it better to talk than to shoot? Well, the hunter was shocked because not only did the bear talk, but he had an English accent. <laughs> but the bear wasn't done. Then the bear went on to say, could we negotiate the matter? Tell, it, tell me what it is you're looking for. Hunter said, I want a fur coat. Ah, said the bear, now we're getting somewhere because I want a full stomach. <laughs> so they disappeared into the forest together. Only the bear came out afterwards. Apparently the negotiations had been successful. Everyone got what they wanted. The bear got a full stomach and the hunter got a fur coat. <laughs> That's what it's like when you do a deal with the devil. <laughs> there are some people you never want to negotiate with. I have a friend who's like the master negotiator. In fact, he is brutal. I call him the force of nature. But here's the problem. You don't want to negotiate with him. You want him to negotiate for you, right? You don't want to get into any kind of a deal with the devil because it may seem good for a moment, but it's always going to be a bad deal for you. This is why the Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.27, don't give place to the devil. Or as another translation puts it, don't give the devil a foothold. So Satan, Lucifer, is cunning, he's clever, he's wicked, he's evil, and he's been honing his craft for a long time. He knows that he generally cannot bring a Christian down in one fell swoop, therefore he tries to dismantle them one bite at a time. Uh, and this is often done through the subtle and very effective trap of compromise. Show me a Christian that's starting to compromise, and I will show you a Christian who is headed towards spiritual ruin. Let me say that again. Show me a Christian who's starting to compromise, lower their guard here, lower it there, going back to old vices, old sins, just a little bit, not all the way, just a little. You see that happen, and I can tell you they're headed towards spiritual ruin. Okay, so where are we in our series in the house of David at this point? David is running from the very jealous King Saul. Saul has been rejected from ruling over Israel because of his disobedience to God. David has been chosen to be the next king, and he's even been anointed by the prophet Samuel. Saul is going to do everything in his power to stop David from ascending to the throne. Saul reminds us in many ways of Satan. He's relentless. He wants to murder David, and David is on the run. Now, here's David who has had such a great victory. He defeated the giant Goliath. He's defeated Philistines in battle. He is a warrior. He, he is a worshiper. He is a man of integrity. But then the Lord begins to take away every little crutch David could potentially lean on. His family has effectively abandoned him. His wife has betrayed him. His best friend really can't help him. 
and his father-in-law wants to kill him. So David has a temporary lapse of faith. And in desperation, he goes to a place called Gath for some comfort. Now, Gath doesn't mean a lot to us, but actually it was Philistine central. Gath is where Goliath came from. So here is David, who is a legend in his own time, walking through town. Everyone recognizes him immediately, including the king. And now David realizes he's in trouble, so he pretends to be insane. Now he, re he runs from Gath and goes to a cave, and he's all by himself. He's tried to fix things. He's only made them worse. He doesn't know what to do. Alone in this cave. No one's with him. Not his friends. Not his family. But he is there with the Lord. He was alone with God. And he would emerge from this cave a different man than when he went in. I'm sure he was feeling sorry for himself. Maybe I'm talking to somebody in a similar situation right now. You're not in a literal, literal cave. But you're in a place where you're feeling isolated, hurt, alone, unappreciated, unloved. You've thought, no one cares about me. You've even thought, someone listening to me, somewhere, if I wasn't here, people would probably be happier. <laughs> I want you to know that is the devil talking to you. You are loved. You are needed. You are wanted more than you would ever know. But David was probably feeling pretty down at this point. But look what happens next. Let's go to 1 Samuel 22, 1. David escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Wait, what? His family. His family that effectively wanted nothing to do with him. His father, who wouldn't even acknowledge the existence of his son David when the prophet Samuel came calling, looking for the next king of Israel. His brothers, including Eliab, who mocked David when he showed up on the front lines as Goliath was bellowing from the Valley of Elah, looking for someone to take him on. This family, who had not stood with him, were now back, and they're, they go to the cave to comfort David. Isn't it great to be reconciled to people? Maybe there's a family member you've been estranged from for weeks and months, maybe even years, maybe even decades. And something happened, maybe it was a death of a loved one, maybe it was something else, but you were brought back together and you mended those fences and, and you restored communication. That's a wonderful thing. That just happened for David. That must have been very reassuring. I think his family was finally starting to get David. They took him for granted. Now they're saying, you know what, he, he has done incredibly well. He's handled his success so well. Listen, the greatest test of character is not failure, it's success. I've seen success churn more than one head and a person completely changes. You give them a little power and authority and they become a different person. Start with those mall cops, right? <laughs> First of all, it's hard to take a mall cop seriously when they drive around on those little things, even as a light going, right? And they pull over, uh, you're under arrest. Um, I'm going to take you back to the station. Get on my little vehicle and hold on to me. Let's go. You know, <laughs> they get a little, they act like they're law enforcement. They are. They're mall cops, right? But some people, oh, they get that position. They, they get a little more authority. And all of a sudden, they become a different person. They don't handle success or power well. David did. He remained humble. He remained considerate of others. And the family could finally see that. But that, that's not the only ones that supported him. Look who else showed up. First Samuel 22, 2. Everyone who is in distress, everyone who is in debt, everyone who is discontented gathered to David, and he became captain over them, and there were about 400 men with him. I love this twist in the story. What a motley crew this was. This ragtag army. They could be classified 3D, distressed, in debt, and discontented. First, everyone who is distressed. This means people who are under pressure. So David is now suddenly surrounded by stressed out people. Okay, 
But that's not all. Now everyone who is in debt, literally people who owed money to a lot of creditors. So he's surrounded by stressed out people who are saying, I'm just really stressed. Hey man, can I borrow some money? I, I didn't, that, that's not all. Everyone who is discontented, this means to be bitter of soul. People who have been wronged and mistreated. Oh man, you ever hang around with bitter people? They complain about everything and everyone, nothing ever meets their expectations. So these people were surrounding David. All of his rowdy friends were coming over tonight. And God was gonna transform this group of discontented, distressed people in debt and turn them into David's mighty men of valor. Listen to this. God specializes in, take, specializes in taking the outcasts of the culture and making them people of God. Let me say that again. God specializes in taking the outcasts of our culture and turning them in to men and women of God. I mean, think about the apostles. We put them on pedestals. But these guys were not the cream of the crop. Peter, the impulsive, hot-headed fisherman. James and John, the sons of thunder who wanted to call fire down on people who were not hospitable to them. Matthew, the tax collector, who was working for the occupying force of Rome and in effect was betraying his own nation. And then there's Simon the terrorist. We call him Simon the zealot, but he's more like Simon the terrorist dedicated to the violent overthrow of Rome. Jesus handpicks these disciples and he says, these are the men I'm gonna turn the world upside down with. Throw in some others and these become the leaders of the early church. Here's how the Apostle Paul summed it up in 1 Corinthians 126. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when God called you into this life. I don't see many of the brightest and the best, not many influential, not many from high society families, isn't it obvious, Paul says, that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses? God chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the somebodies. How true that is. So here is David now with this reject army. David has suddenly become Robin Hood <laughs> with his band of merry men. His Sherwood Forest is the Judean wilderness. He's the outlaw king now. The outlaw king waiting for Saul to be dethroned. He's like William Wallace from the Braveheart movie. He's like Maximus, Meridius, Decimus taking on Caesar. He's like David taking on Saul. That's exactly what he is. Or he's Luke Skywalker taking on Darth Vader. Whatever picture you like, this is what we're seeing. This is David with a small little force taking on the powerful king and his massive force. And at this moment, David wrote Psalm 57. He's looking around at all these people, stressed out, agitated, bitter, angry, in debt. And, and he writes this, Psalm 57, verse 4, my soul is among lions. I must lie down among those who breathe forth fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows. Wait, David, what? No, he's seen their potential. Yeah, these guys, I know what they are, but these are lions. I'm hanging around lions with great strength that breathe forth fire, reminding us that God sees us not just for what we are, he sees us for what we will be. We see a blank canvas, God sees a finished painting. We see a failure, God sees potential. We see the past, God sees the future. We see a mess, God sees a message. We see a zero, God sees a potential hero. He sees you for what you can become. So the old David is back now, he's rejoicing. Again, Psalm 57, written at this time, he says, my heart is steadfast, O Lord, my heart is steadfast. I will sing, I'll sing praises. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. So David's come through a test. He's passed the test with flying colors. Now, here comes another test. This is a big one. Saul is pursuing David at this time with 3,000 armed men. David and his mighty men are on the run. 
Now what appears to be an opportunity for David opens up. Let's read about it, 1 Samuel 24, looking at verse three. Again, 1 Samuel 24, verse three. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. At the place where the road passes some, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. Do we all understand what that means? Okay. So he's going to the bathroom before there were bathrooms. And as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. The Lord is telling you, I put your enemy into your power. Do with him as you please. So David crept forward and cut out a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord the King. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. Wow. So here's the test for David. Would he be merciful or would he be angry and bitter like King Saul? David had every justification to take the life of Saul. Saul had thrown javelins at him. Saul wanted him dead, but yet David could have taken revenge at this point, and he chose to not do it. 1 Samuel 23, 14 says, Saul sought him every day, but God did not deliver David into his hand. So this is day in and day out, month in, month out, year in, year out. He can kill this guy and be done with it. But David, his conscience is bothering him. Wow, what a... What a tender conscience he had, right? And this reminds us why he was a man after God's own heart. Listen to this. If God has given you a tender conscience, don't do anything to mess with it. I love it when we're sensitive to things like this because some people are not. But here is the devil hunting down David through Saul. And it's just like Satan. The Bible says it's like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour there's an interesting story in the book of Job. The angels of God present them before the Lord, present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, also known as Lucifer, is among them. Understand, Satan is a fallen angel. He wasn't created as what we call the devil. He doesn't have pointed ears. He doesn't have horns. He doesn't have hoofs. He doesn't have a pitchfork, and his skin is not red. That's all a caricature. He's a beautiful angel. And if we were appear to appear to us right now, we would all be very impressed. But he's a fallen angel. But in the story in Job, he appears along with other angels, holy angels of God. And the Lord asks Satan, where have you come from? Satan replies, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. It might surprise you to know that the devil believes the Bible is true. He does. The Bible says that demons believe and tremble. And he knows that the Bible has warned him that his days are numbered because Romans 12, 12 says of Satan, he has come down to us with great wrath knowing his time is short. Another translation puts that verse this way. The Lord or the devil's come down on you with both feet. He's had a great fall. He's wild and raging with anger and he hasn't much time, and he knows it. He's wild. He's angry. He's ticked off. His days are numbered. He knows it. He wants to wreak as much havoc as he possibly can until the day of his judgment. That's just like King Saul. It says getting old. David could have taken him out, but he chose not to do it. All right, so that brings us to point number one, if you're taking notes. Point number one is we need to do God's will the right way at the right time. We need to do God's will the right way at the right time. Listen, God will accomplish his will in your life in his perfect timing, and he doesn't need your help. Let me add to that. In fact, if you try to assist the Lord, you may make it much worse, not better. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Oh, I know it's hard. 
I know if you're married to a non-Christian man, you want him to come to Christ, so you're gonna help out the Holy Spirit. You're gonna nag your husband into the kingdom of God. No, you won't. No, I'm got, when I make his lunch in the morning, I'm gonna put Bible tracts in his sandwiches. Yeah, that'll reach him for sure. Or you have that child who is not following the Lord as you raise them to, and they're not believing everything you've taught them, and you feel that you're a catastrophic failure as a parent. You keep praying for that child, and you don't give up on that child, and know that God wants to reach them even more than you want to reach them. God will accomplish his will in his time. Now, it is clear that David, not Saul, would ultimately be king. When and how that would happen, it was not clear. But David refused to strike Saul because he recognized that his position, that is Saul, was from God. He was placed there as the king, sort of like the military idea of saluting the rank, uh, not necessarily the person. In other words, even if I don't respect that commanding officer, they rank above me, so I salute the rank. I have respect. That's what David was doing here. But he has this tender heart toward God, and he doesn't want to take Saul's life. He even feels bad about cutting Saul's robe, bringing me to point number two. We should not take vengeance on people even if they deserve it. We should not take vengeance on people even if they deserve it. David chooses to forgive Saul instead of taking vengeance on him. Vengeance is not ours to deal out. It's God's. I told you to turn to Romans 12. Here's what I wanted to read to you. Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. There it is. Oh, I know. That's a tall order. I know that isn't easy. I know that doesn't come naturally. Because we live in a world today of conflict. Now, we've always had conflict, but I think it's worse today than any time in my life where people are attacking each other, where people are uh, always in conflict with someone else, and, and violence is escalating, and, and then you have social media that amplifies everything. And then you go to a movie, and it's about exalting vengeance. The whole plot of the film is waiting for the bad guy to get it from the good guy, right? And it makes you feel like payback is the answer, not forgiveness. But here's what we're taught in scripture. Point number three, instead of taking vengeance, we should instead forgive. Now, it's hard enough to not pay someone back. That's hard. But to forgive them? Oh, that's even harder, right? But here's what the Bible says, Ephesians 4.31. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. How many of you by nature are easygoing, forgiving people? Raise your hand up. Oh. How many of you are not? Raise your hand up. Yeah, there you are. You're my people. <laughs> I'm the latter, not the former. I by nature am not the kind of person that wants to turn the other cheek. You hit me, I want to hit you back. You insult me, I have a better insult to hurl back at you. But that is not what God wants me to do. But it's my nature that has to be suppressed. I'm commanded in scripture to forgive. I love the statement of C.S. Lewis. He said, quote, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely thing until they have someone to forgive, right? Great concept, I'm for it, forgiveness, yes. Then someone wrongs you. Then someone hurts you. Then someone slanders you. Or they tell a lie about you. And you say, this isn't right, I gotta get them back. And then you start thinking about personally forgiving them, it's not easy. I, like you, have had people hurt me through my life. A lot of it was in my childhood with my mother's revolving door of husbands that came and went. Seven in total. After the third guy, I got tired of calling them dad. My mom would literally say, this is your new dad? 
And even as a little boy, I thought, this is just not right. Even though it was the only reality I knew. And so I became kind of hard and angry as a young man and got in trouble a lot in school because I kind of felt it was me versus the world. I had to come to a point where I would forgive my mom and forgive those men and all of those people. And then even as a believer and as a pastor, I've been hurt. I've been betrayed. I've been attacked. I've been slandered, just like you. But I forgive these people, not because I'm so wonderful, though I am. Let me tell you why I do it. I do it because the Lord tells me to, but I do it for another reason. I do it for my own sanity. For my own sanity. Forgiveness does not mean condoning bad behavior. It's not dismissing it. It may not even mean reconciliation because that's not only possible. To forgive means I'm surrendering my right to get even and I'm leaving it into the hands of God. That's all. It doesn't mean I'll necessarily even be reconciled with that person because some people don't want to reconcile at all. But it means that I'm getting free of that person. Forgiveness is not giving in to the person who hurt you. It's getting free from that person. Get it? And guess what? Even psychologists are acknowledging the power of forgiveness. There was an interesting article in Time Magazine about forgiveness. It was titled, Should All Be Forgiven? Quoting from it, it says, scientists and sociologists have begun to extract forgiveness and the act of forgiving, act of forgiving from the confines of the confessional, transforming it into the subject of quantifiable research, end quote. So, you know, let me just sort of paraphrase that. Scientists are saying this isn't just for people in church. This is for everybody. And one writer went on to say several psychotherapists are testifying that there's nothing like forgiveness for dissipating anger, mending marriages, and banning depression. They're not even looking at this biblically. They're just saying, hey, we found when you forgive, you'll be a happier person. We found when you forgive, you'll have a better marriage. We found that when you forgive, your depression will not be what it was. So it's good for you spiritually. It's good for you physically. It's good for you psychologically. And if you're a child of God, it's not an option. It's a command. Back to our story. So King Saul has done his business And from a safe distance, David says, hey, king, uh, notice that draft in the old robe? And he holds it up and says, I cut it off. I could have killed you, but I chose to not do it. All of a sudden, it appears that King Saul is having a change of heart. Back to 1 Samuel 24, verse 16. Saul calls back, is that really you, my son, David? And he began to cry. And he said to David, you're a better man than I am. You repaid me good for evil. You've been amazingly kind to me today. The Lord put you in a place where you could have killed me. You didn't do it. Who else, says Saul, would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you for your kindness. You've shown me today. For now I realize that you are surely going to be king. And the king, kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. Wow. That looks pretty good at face value, right? And this, by the way, is the first time that Saul acknowledged that David was now the rightful king. So this appears to be a game changer. Okay, this is good. This is progress. But was Saul really repentant? The Bible says godly sorrow produces repentance. What that simply means is, if you're really sorry, your behavior will change. And if your behavior doesn't change. Are you really sorry? Are you really repentant? As they say, the proof is in the pudding. I don't know what proof we're looking for in the pudding, but we're told it's there. But it simply means that if you really mean it, you'll have evidence to back it up. I don't think there was any repentance in Saul's life. 
If he was, was sincere, he would have given the royal robe and crown to David right there on the spot. But Saul went back to his palace in Jerusalem. He had no intention of abdicating his throne. But David was no fool. He didn't go home with Saul. He could have said, hey, it's all good. Let's go back. Let's have a meal together. David said, nah, I've had a few too many javelins thrown at me. I don't trust this guy. And he was right to not trust the guy because Saul would be back soon with 3,000 fresh troops to hunt down David. This brings me to my last point. You can't make deals with the devil. You can't make deals with the devil. So I have five grandchildren and four girls. One of them is here today. And I have one grandson. Boys are very different than girls. <laughs> Understatement of the century. And what girls want for a birthday present or for Christmas is way different than what boys want. So I got my grandson what he asked me for for Christmas, which was a snake. Because nothing says the birth of Jesus like a serpent. <laughs> it's a little black king snake, really cute, about this long. And uh, so, you know, they have to feed the snake little rodents. You know that. Sorry to break this to you if you don't know that. They're not vegetarians. <laughs> you can't feed them kale. So he feeds them these tiny little mice. And uh, so in this room where the snake lives in this little secure cage that he can't get out of is another cage about 10 feet away that has a hamster. You already know what happened. <laughs> so the other day, Jonathan, Christopher's dad, said, hey, buddy, I haven't seen that hamster for a while. Why don't you go check on him, make sure he has food and water? So Christopher goes to the hamster's cage and there's kind of some sawdust on the bottom and sometimes the hamster hides. He's looking everywhere, looking for it. Can't find the hamster. All of a sudden, he pulls out the snake. Somehow the snake got from the hamster's cage over, or excuse me, from the snake cage over to the hamster's cage. So I think there was a conversation. And the hamster was looking at the snake and then snake says, let's negotiate. What is it you want? <laughs> Hamster said, I want a snake skin jacket. <laughs> and the snake said, good, I want a full stomach. You figure out what happened. That's what happens when you make deals with a devil. Oh, I've got this under control. I, this will never be a problem. This is secure. This will never come into my life. I can even lower my guard. No, the devil is very sly. A snake can get out of the tightest little spaces. I know this because as a kid, I too had many snakes and they got out of their cages all the time. One time I had a beautiful snake I'd been saving up for and it got out of its cage and my mother who hated my snakes but tolerated them said it came slithering to the front room. I said, what did you do? She says, I opened up the glass door and just let him keep going. <laughs> no, that's my snake. Let him keep going. That's the devil. You give him an inch, you'll take a mile. You give him a little bit, he'll take more. Don't make deals with the devil. We've got to learn that story for sure. So my recent book, my latest book rather, is called Lennon, Dylan, Alice, and Jesus. <clears throat> On the cover is a photograph of John Lennon, Bob Dylan, Alice Cooper, and an image of Jesus. And some people who didn't read the book but literally judged the book by its cover said, you know, these people can't be saved. They made deals with the devil. Almost as though Satan appears to them, has a document, they sign it. Okay, if I make you a successful rock star, you belong to me forever. Listen, it is possible in a broad sense to make a deal with the devil. And by that I mean you can, of course, uh, compromise and give in to sin and enticement and be entrapped by him. But if you want to get out of that deal, you can get out of it because Jesus paid for that on the cross of Calvary. <laughs> Colossians 2.14 says, Christ canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. So when you believe in Jesus and ask him to forgive you of your sin, all deals are off. Oh no, people say, they sold their soul to the devil. You can't sell your soul to the devil. 
God owns your soul. And you belong to him if you've trusted in Christ. So let's wrap this message up now. Who are these people that came to David? They were distressed, they were in debt, and they were discontented. This sounds like you and me. Why did we come to Jesus? Let's think of David as representing Christ. We came to Jesus because we're distressed. Rarely will a person turn to Christ when everything's going well. You know, when all the bills are paid and the sky is blue and the birds are singing and the phone is charged and everything's great. And then crisis hits. Or they have a problem with an addiction. Or they have a problem in their marriage. Or they have a problem with their family. Or they have an issue with their health. Something happens and they're distressed. And they come to the Lord. Yo, oh, that means they're weak. No, that means they're smart. Stupid people are the ones that don't come to Jesus. Oh, that's not very nice. Wait. Every one of us is weak. Every one of us is in need. If we saw our true spiritual state before God, it would shock us because we stand as sinners separated from a holy God who wants to forgive us so much that he sent his own son to die in our place. And if we reject that offer of forgiveness, that's insanity. So sure, when we're distressed, we come to Jesus. Most people do, not all, but most. The prodigal son came to the end of himself and he found the beginning of God, and he returned to his father. Those who were in debt were all in debt spiritually. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, and we pay for it. As I've often said in our crusades especially, Christ came to pay a debt he did not owe because we owed a debt we could not pay. So we're in debt, so we come to Jesus, and those who are discontented, you know, you can have everything the world offers and be empty. In fact, I think you find yourself more empty when you've been there and done that and bought the T-shirt. I explore that in this book, uh, Lennon, Dylan, Allison, Jesus, how so many of these people reach the top and they find out there's nothing there. We think, why do these people who have it all take their own lives? Why do these people who have everything that one would dream of want to get addicted to drugs or alcohol or have all these other problems because they figured out for themselves that those things are not the answer. As long as you think, if I just get to this place, I'll be happy, that might keep you going. But when you get to that place and go beyond that place and go beyond it even more and see how empty it all is, this is why these people end up so messed up. Amy Winehouse, a very talented singer, made this statement and I quote, famous like a terminal cancer. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. And tragically, she died of alcohol poisoning. So we're just like these people. We're distressed, we're in debt, we're discontented. So the people had a choice. Who did they want their king to be? Do you wanna follow Saul or do you wanna follow David? We have the same choice. Who do we want our king to be? Are we gonna follow Satan or are we gonna follow Jesus? You say, well, I wouldn't put it quite that way. I'm kind of the master of my own destiny, the captain of my own ship. Oh, give me a break. You are not. Do you think you're in control of your life? You aren't. The reality is the God of this world, also known as the devil, has you under his control. The only one who can free you from that power is Christ himself. So you make that choice. You choose who your king will be. You choose who you're going to follow. Every day you get up, you make that choice and you make more choices to affirm that choice. You make right choices or wrong choices and then you make your choices and your choices make you. Follow Jesus. He is the king worth following. He is the one that will truly set you free. He is the one that will take you one day to his kingdom. Remember what he said to the thief on the cross? That man said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, verily, verily, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's the hope of the Christian. 
before Jesus, <coughs> excuse me, went to the cross, he was in the upper room with his disciples. And he was about to have what would be known as the Last Supper. But they didn't know it was the Last Supper. But it was. And he broke the bread and he took the cup. Here's what happened. And let me read it to you from Paul's account of it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He says in verse 21, For I pass on to you that which I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed. The Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Paul writes, Jesus took of the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people in agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And as often as you drink it, and every time you eat of this bread, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Now Paul offers this word of exhortation. Anyone who eats this bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of our Lord. Therefore, before eating the bread or drinking the cup, you should examine yourself. All right, so we're gonna receive communion together in just a moment. Did you all get your elements as you came in? We're gonna open that. In fact, why don't you go ahead and open that and get the bread out. And uh, let's just take a moment to pray and prepare our hearts and examine ourselves as we think about what we're about to do. We're, we're honoring the request of Jesus to do this in remembrance of him. And Father, we pray now as we get ready to receive these elements of communion that we will honor your name and glorify you. And if there's any area of our life that is not right before you, if there's an area of compromise where the devil has gotten a foothold, Lord, show us what it is so we can turn from it, repent of it, and receive the forgiveness you offer. We worship you, Lord, in this moment. Take that bread now and hold it if you would. Let's pray. Father, as we take of this bread symbolizing the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you will extend your hand of healing to those who are in need. I'm sure that among us right now, somewhere, those who are watching, wherever, that there's someone 
that has been given bad news from a doctor, someone who has a pain, an ailment of some kind, maybe very serious, maybe not that serious, but still it causes discomfort. Lord, you've promised to heal. We know you don't heal all, but we know you heal some according to your will. And we know that you tell us in Scripture, we have not because we ask not. And we also know that Scripture tells us that by his stripes we're healed. So Lord, as we think about that whip that came upon your back some 2,000 years ago, and as we take of this bread that symbolizes your broken body, extend your healing hand and touch those in need, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask this. Let's partake together. I'll take that cup. This cup symbolizes the blood of Christ that was shed from the cross of Calvary for your sin and mine. Let's pray. Lord, we have sinned. We acknowledge we've sinned. We're sorry for our sin. We repent of our sin and we ask you to forgive us. You've promised if we will walk in the light as you were in the light, we will have fellowship with you and the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. Lord, would you cleanse us now? Thank you for the cleansing power of the blood of Christ. Let's partake together. 